Hi there, I'm Tom Spencer. This week on Central Texas Gardener, see how to grow drought-tough bulbs that stick around year after year with Brent Heath from Brent and Becky's Bulbs. On tour, visit a makeover that tackled flooding, invasive plants, and a lack of privacy. Daphne makes her pick of the week, and Trisha has your backyard basics tips. So let's get growing right here, right now. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. Do you have an issue with seasonal flooding, invasive plants, and a lack of privacy? Pick one or all and see how this makeover tackled them to turn an old yard into a new garden. Helen Thompson is a writer who has revealed all things beautiful, interesting, and tasty in her years as a journalist. In 2012, she joined Interiors Texas magazine as contributing editor and writer. When she and husband Charles Mormon renovated her childhood home in 2008, her knowledge of architectural and interior design came in handy. There were two things that drove this garden design, and one was the drainage, which was a really, you know, just a, an urgent problem. But the other thing was I wanted nice views from every room. Charles, editor-in-chief and publisher of Texas Highways Magazine, brings home his impressions too. One of the major considerations here was, was a practical one, which was drainage, but we didn't want that to be too obvious. In this part of uh, Austin, there are wet weather springs and seeps. The problem was the water then went under the house. In wet weather, they just kind of bubble to the surface. First, to deal with wood rot and termite damage and update the old house to newborn efficiency, they worked with builder, remodeler, Jerry Santini. To channel seasonal overflow and heavy rains away from the house, Patrick devised a route, including French drains and Cibolo pea gravel, which dispersed the water on its pathway to the back. And then we started to kind of rebuild the landscape because basically we, we had to demo the whole front yard. I mean, all the plants, all the grass, soil, everything, so that we could get the water to move away from the house. To further control water from the street, Patrick and Jerry regraded the intense slope and devised a multi-box approach to raise up the garden. We wanted to have different levels so we'd have a different theme sort of in each box. We wanted to differentiate the boxes not only in, in the heights of the boxes but in the size of them. Patrick improved their permeability with a gritty soil blend. In this part of Austin, the soil is very clay-like and, and is either really wet or really dry. Each box gets its own personality with drought-tough, low-maintenance plants and palisade zoysia. Boxwoods unify and define their enclosures, including resilient roses. We tried to use very few plants and kind of use masses of them so that it kind of all came together and so the boxwoods are kind of all throughout the garden and they kind of tie everything together. This grid system that he organized makes it seem orderly, even though it's not sometimes. You know, the leaves do fall. This is not quite as stark as, as most modern gardens. It's, it's very lush, but it's very organized and structured. Each arena aligns with a section of the house. Patrick dedicated a front portion to annual fernleaf lavender that survives mild winters. You know, the monarchs really, when they're migrating, we get little clouds of, mon of uh, monarchs around the la lavender, and uh, the bees are always at work there too, so that's great. One bed is for vegetables. At taping time, summer crops were over and winter ones newly installed. Charles suddenly burst forth and said, I've always wanted a vegetable garden. I said, oh, you have? Oh, no. This is the first I've heard of it. And, of course, that's a sunny spot. And it's an obvious great place for it. The backyard is, is very shady. We've been amazed at how productive just a small space can be. You know, I feel like gardens like that are real social. People stop by. They want to talk about it or, or we'll give them stuff. It's really great to come out and, and have a sense of of different environments in this small, you know, re relatively small space. 
and then create like over here we've created a courtyard there and which will become more pronounced as these shrubs grow up. Charles and, and Helen have their offices facing the, the side of the house so we provided a screen with the bamboo and then we provided kind of a little niche space for them to be able to look out when they're sitting at their desk working and writing and so they have this kind of little private space that's theirs to enjoy while they're working. He just was so concerned that I would have something nice to look at, and, and I do now. And the hummingbirds come out, and, and it's just a, and we've watched little cardinals grow up and learn to fly out there. It's just been a really great, really, really lovely thing for me to look at. Looters pavers connect it all with a spacious clean look and firm footing on gravel. Against the house, Patrick didn't replant when he removed grass and overgrown shrubs. The primary reason was to get the water away from the house and we didn't want any sprinklers or anything up against the foundation. Patrick did include a few low water accents near the entrance. Here, Jerry replaced the old rickety gates with a modern look that fits the home even better. They're ideal to give Helen and Charles a cozy enclosure. It's got big, deep eaves, and the best time to be in it is in a rain, a little soft rain, because you're kind of sheltered. It's great. I love that courtyard. I absolutely love that courtyard. <laughs> they widened the driveway and replaced asphalt with pea gravel to absorb even more water. Looters pavers unify its front door and garden connection. In back, Patrick channeled the street water into a rill to gently disperse it without damaging the neighbors. It does a lot because the, the water actually gets to percolate down through the soils and then through the gravel. So there's no rushing water. The gravel is a really good filter. So when the water does get to the rill, it's, it's kind of sort of cleaned out. The privacy issue we dealt with with um, large clumping bamboos and Montezuma cypress trees. Mainly because in the wet weather months, the trees and the bamboo can take advantage of it and Montezuma cypress are also extremely drought tolerant. So in the drier times, they can live without the water. Jerry came up with these trellises that he had made and they go up about 12, 15 feet and then we planted evergreen clematis on those and star jasmine and they kind of run the length of the backyard in sections where we had lots of visibility into the neighbors and vice versa. There's still some low water zoysia for rescued Cosmo when he comes outside, now joined by his pal, who Helen and Charles sprung from a puppy mill. It's been a change in more ways than one. I wasn't that excited about, about moving back into my childhood home. I hate to admit it, but I wasn't. This garden has made it wonderful. It really has. It's, it's expanded the space of the house. We spend a lot of time even just standing here or sitting here. It's just been, it's made me happy to be here. I think the thing is that it's just been a very pleasant yard to spend time. And I'll come out and walk around, partly it's just to get some fresh air and to make my eyes adjust to a farther horizon. I will come out here and sit or just walk around and um, get my head cleared and go back in and, and write something really fabulous. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing your garden with us. And right now it's a genuine pleasure to welcome to Central Texas Gardener an, an American gardening legend, Brent Heath from Brent and Becky's Bulbs in Virginia. And anybody who's familiar with bulbs uh, knows that this is one of the hot spots uh, in the world really for getting high quality bulbs uh, that are really gonna perform well in the United States. Welcome to Central Texas Gardener. Wow, thank you very much. <laughs> Delighted to be here. Well, it's great to have you in Austin. And let's start for for the uninitiated. Let's start by talking about Brent and Becky's bulbs. Where in Virginia are you located, and how did you get started? Well, we're located in Tidewater, Virginia, which is the lower part of the Chesapeake Bay, not far from Williamsburg. 
And I actually got started because my grandfather ate a cantaloupe. <laughs> okay. He, he was cantaloupe. actually a damn Yankee. He followed the cantaloupe south. He okay. was from Brookline, Massachusetts. And okay. It was he who started the flower bulb business, the okay. daffodil business. And okay. His initiation, Gloucester and Matthews counties grew more daffodils than anywhere in the world mm -hmm. during the Depression and thereafter up until the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And my family, my father became involved in the business and he and my mother had a mail order business called the Daffodil Mart with 1,500 varieties of daffodils. Oh my goodness, wow. This is what I grew up with. <laughs> uh -huh. And I bought the business from my mother in 1972. Mm -hmm. And I'm... After a brief starter marriage, uh, I ended up marrying <laughs> one of my children's school teachers, okay. Becky, and the business has grown from then. Okay. And now we have the fourth generation involved, okay. which All is right. wonderful. So you have naturalized in this. <laughs> I have indeed. I have indeed. Uh, and I have to say, uh, it just the allusion to. Uh, 1,500 varieties of daffodil it gives people a hint of that, how people can fall into this world <laughs> and really become lost in it and love it and become a passion for people because uh, bulbs are one of the, the those niche areas of gardening that inspires great passion in people. People really respond to bulbs in a different way than they do a lot of other flowers. Why do you think that is? Well, they're the icing on the cake. Okay. You know, they're the shoes and the socks in the <laughs> garden. The, mm -hmm. Uh, they're the basis and then they're the flare. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so neat to have a plant that comes up in short order, surprises you with mm -hmm. spectacular color and, mm -hmm. and then does its growing thing in short time and goes back and spends the rest of the time underground and right. shares that space with other plants that right. follow in sequence. So. Yeah. I think really? the surprise element has a lot to do with it. it, it you know, I remember as a child um, when the first daffodils would come up through the snow in upstate New York often, okay. um, being amazed that they were there all along. That's right. <laughs> you know? That's right. That element of surprise when they do come. Right. Good Lord gives them what they need to prompt them to come up, and sometimes it's day length, mm -hmm. but the early bloomers, more often it's the warmth of the soil that triggers them to come up and right. bloom. Well, you know, you have customers all throughout the United States. Um, we do. Including, I'm sure, many from Central Texas, and I know that being in the field that you're familiar with which bulbs do well where, so let's let's start by talking about some central some varieties that you would recommend to the uninitiated in Central Texas, the people who haven't quite gotten uh, addicted yet to All this right. habit. Well, you're in a warmer part of the country, mm -hmm. so generally speaking, the kinds of bulbs that are from warmer parts of the world will probably do better here. Mm -hmm. And in the world of daffodils, it would be more the Tazetta types, All right. the paper whites, the mm -hmm. old-fashioned 17 sisters types with many flowers on the stem, right, with the musky right. fragrance, yeah. and the Jonquilla types, those sweetly fragrant ones with dark green leaves. Mm -hmm. uh, they're both from warmer climates, and mm. I would suspect they do better here. Yeah. And their hybrids with some of the bigger, more northern types also mm -hmm. will do fairly well here. Yeah. So we have a fair range of daffodils mm -hmm. that I think will perennialize mm -hmm. here. And I like to use that term because most daffodils do not reseed and spread around. And okay. that's what the word naturalized means. Okay, so distinction between naturalized and perennialized. Okay, we've got it. We will no longer <laughs> refer to these things as uh, naturalized. And some bulbs <laughs> do naturalize beautifully. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the little Narcissus jonquilla naturalizes here quite freely. Mm -hmm. It does spread by seed. Okay. As do, for example, rain lilies, which is one of my absolute favorite plant families, especially in, the Zephyranthes. Incredible little plants, and an interesting feature is they're, you know, related to daffodils. I did not know that. They're both in the Amaryllis plant family. Okay, and the Amaryllis plant family okay. has a neat feature and that they're alkaloids contained within the bulbs that render them critter-proof. Ah. So nothing eats any amaryllis, mm -hmm. eh, except a grasshopper. There's one grasshopper <laughs> in Florida, and you may have the lubber here also. Uh -huh. They can tolerate the alkaloids, but that's the only thing that can 
So Amaryllis family members, daffodils, mm -hmm. zephyranthes, uh, Lycogum, okay, and Lycogum is a great plant for us here. Are all critter proof. Now you may not have critters here that mm -hmm. you worry about eating in your gardens. Mm -hmm. No voles, rabbits, squirrels, deer. Deer is oh, deer. A, a huge issue in this region. Well, an enormous deer herd. They yeah. don't eat any amaryllis. Okay, so you're all right. You're safe Duly plant. noted. And in the amaryllid family as well, one of, another all-time favorite of mine is what we call the oxblood lily. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the oxblood lily is Rhodophiala bifida mm -hmm. from Chile. Mm -hmm. And also an interesting plant. Many bulbs are montane, mm -hmm. coming from mountainous sure. climates mm -hmm. where dry summers, mm -hmm. they retreat underground. Exactly. And moisture during the winters, they come up and grow and do their thing, mm -hmm. or early springs. But... um. Yeah, another along this line are the Lycoris. Yeah. And the absolutely. Lycoris are actually from Asia, from mm -hmm. Japan and China. Mm -hmm. And they're wonderful fall bloomers. You're right. Another little one called Sternbergia lutea, which is actually from Turkey and Iraq mm -hmm. and Iran. It looks like a yellow crocus, but mm -hmm. it's an amaryllis also. Okay. It's a fall bloomer. Sternbergia. Okay. I've not um, seen it on the market here, but and, I don't think I've ever gardened with it. And I I think my sister has it in her garden here. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're lovely. They have winter leaves. And the Rhodophiella and the mm -hmm. Lycoris and the Sternbergia all have winter leaves. Right. But your climate's mild enough that they aren't affected by light frost. Ooh. Mild is a, a nice word to use a better climate. <laughs> okay. All right. Our summers tend to last about eight months. All right. And well. so summer blooming bulbs, you know, crinums um, uh, are one that I think of, in, at least for an early summer plant. Another amaryllis, uh, crinums uh, okay, are. sure. And a very moisture, uh, very drought tolerant, mm -hmm. um, but also a moisture tolerant. Yeah, they They'll can, grow in, in quite swamps. heavy, wet soils. Mm -hmm which is kind of fun for them. Yeah. And um, they are they're pass along plants. Mm -hmm. They stay with you forever. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're grandmothers that pass them on and they get passed on and on and those bulbs, mother bulbs, of course, divide and, mm -hmm. and uh, eventually end up with big clumps, but mm -hmm. Great, and that you can, well, they're kind of hard to dig. <laughs> they go to some China. Of, well, they do, and some of the bulbs can weigh 60 pounds. Oh, they can get quite big. <laughs> Acrinum asiaticum, which is a 60 pound bulb. <laughs> no, it's not a hardy one for us. Uh -huh, right. But, uh, so you're a little warmer than we are, probably. Well, I think so. But yeah. it is a classic pass along plant. In fact, the only crinums I've ever had in any of my gardens. Ended up, a mysterious visitor left some at my doorstep once. Oh, wow. Isn't that nice? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Wasn't and, that and a great now thing? Now that, that they've been in multiple gardens of mine, and uh, ha happily so. You know. neat to be able to touch someone <laughs> yeah. in a positive way, to yeah. give them a surprise, and right. you don't know where it came from. I, I didn't even know which variety it was. So. If each of us would do something like that every day, we'd have so much nicer world to live in. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Now, oh, and we just have a little bit of time, so I want to make sure people are firmly aware, again, of the nature of the business. It's Brent and Becky's Bulbs, and uh, obviously can be found online, but I have to say one of the great pleasures of doing business with you is getting the catalog, which oh. is a dream machine. Well, that's my <laughs> wife's fault. She's the artist who puts all that together. I married well. I married a smart woman. And, and then if it's a web stuff, that's my son's fault. He does okay. all of that. Multi-generational. It is a, It's a good thing. It's a very good thing. Well, again, we, we are deeply appreciative of you making your way uh, to the studios here to visit with us at Central Texas Gardener. Best wishes to you and Becky both. Well, I certainly appreciate your having me, and if you're ever visiting in the Williamsburg area, be, please be sure to come to visit Becky's Teaching Garden, a 10-acre uh, themed idea garden room. All right, excellent. Well, thank you so much, and coming up is our friend Daphne. Hi, I'm Daphne Richards, and this is Augie. Our plant this week is red corn poppy, Papaver roeus, also known as Flanders poppy. As you may know, the fall is the season to plant wildflowers in Central Texas and in many other parts of the nation. And we're blessed to have several wonderful sources for bulk wildflower seeds, making this an easy way to fill in large spaces, even on a budget. If you're just starting out, planting wildflowers may also give you some time to figure out a more permanent plan while still bringing beauty into the yard. 
The strikingly red blooms of corn poppy make a lovely combination with yellow columbine or blue larkspur. And the leaves of poppies are very inconspicuous, leaving the most visual element, those gorgeous blooms, plenty of room to shine. The seed of corn poppies are easily saved for next season, giving you a continuous source without having to make a new purchase every year. Being true annuals, the plants will die back and need to be removed once the flowers are all spent. And you'll recognize when to do that when the plant stops blooming and the foliage starts to yellow and the plants dry up or fall over. Our question this week also involves wildflowers and why they may not come up after planting outdoors. One reason may be that they were planted too deeply. An easy way to gauge how deeply to plant seeds is seed size. The smaller the seed, the more shallow it should be planted and corn poppy seeds are pretty tiny, which is why you'll see instructions on many wildflower seed packets to only lightly scratch the seeds into the soil, not plant them in holes. Another reason for sparse wildflower coverage might be an autumn rain shower, which could wash the seed away and also cover it with more soil, leading back to our first issue. <clears throat> I planted lots of flowers from seed in my garden when I moved to Austin in 2009. And in September of that year, I got over seven inches of rain in just one day. Needless to say, most of my seeds didn't come up and those that did, didn't end up where I planted them. But maybe that was nature's way of making re me relax about the perfect plan that I thought I had and loosen up to a more natural look in my garden. The result was, of course, still quite beautiful. Our viewer picture this week comes from Jean McWeeny, who snapped this sweet little hummingbird on her black and blue salvia. Thanks, Jean. To do in your garden this week, if you have a lawn, fertilize it with a 3-1-2 ratio fertilizer. After the extreme summer heat, most lawns are stressed, and now, as the temperatures have finally cooled down, turf has a short window to put on new growth, which will help it survive the inevitable stress of next summer. Just a little nutrition now will help your lawn survive current and even more restrictive watering restrictions, even during a continued drought. Turf is much tougher than we give it credit for and can easily survive long periods without extra water with just a little help during cooler weather. We'd love to hear from you, so please visit us at klru.org ctg with your questions and plants from your garden. Thanks, Stephanie. Now let's check in with Trisha Shirey. Cover crops for the winter garden really make a lot of sense. Many of our winter garden vegetables don't require as much space as the space hogging okra and tomatoes and corn of the summer, so you may not need as much of your garden space, or you may just want to take a break from gardening for a while, or you might want to confine your garden to a smaller area so you're not using as much of water, but don't let that garden just sit empty. Cover crops can help improve your soil, control weeds, prevent erosion, and they can even help with soil pests. So uh, worms and beneficial soil organisms will really thrive in the root zone of cover crops. Now cover crops are called green manure often because they add nitrogen to the soil especially the leguminous cover crops. They grow in really thick, so they suppress chickweed, henbit, and other cool season weeds that can really be prolific in their seeding. You wanna get your cover crops planted several weeks before the first frost date to get them established well before the cold sets in. You don't really need to fertilize cover crops. Just remove your crops that you've had for the summer, loosen the soil a bit and plant the seeds. Now birds may eat a lot of these cover crop seeds, so you may want to use row cover to protect them, uh, to get them germinated before you uncover. Now root knot nematodes can be controlled with a cover crop of Elbon or cereal rye. This this is not annual rye. It actually grows much taller than annual rye, but you don't want to let this go to seed, otherwise you'll be picking out annual rye for a long time. Annual rye gets pretty tall. It'll grow 30 to 36 inches, and you can cut it to the ground several times during the growing season and use those cuttings of the rye grass for a very rich nitrogen compost ingredient to mix with your fall leaves. So you'll have plenty of compost to go uh, into the spring garden when you're growing the Elbon rye uh, as a nitrogen source. The roots of the rye trap nematodes and they kill them. Other crops that are good for nematode control include mustard and marigolds. 
Other cover crops you might want to try are crimson clover, which is a medicinal. The flowers are used for teas, and bees love it. It's a very high nitrogen cover crop and really beautiful, too. Vetch is also a great cover crop and uh, it, it, good for beneficial insects attracting, too. Uh, but you may need to inoculate that with rhizobium bacteria to get good germination. Now, cover crops will need a little bit of water to get started. In fact, I, I like to wet the the seed bed down very well before I put the seeds in. Some of them will need a little bit of cover of uh, soil over them, but give them uh, a light watering every day to get them germinated, and uh, they'll take off really well for you. And on the website, I'll have seeding rates of the uh, cover crops, so check out klru.org. You can cut down the tops of these cover crops in the spring and actually just leave the roots in the soil. You can turn them in, but you could also just dig holes for your tomatoes, your peppers, and other plants right into the cover crops and leave the roots there. The roots will retain moisture, increase soil life, and you'll have a much better garden when you're using cover crops over winter. For Backyard Basics, I'm Trisha Shirey. Find out more at klru.org slash ctg and check us out on Facebook. Next week, Tree Folks has some alternatives for your troubled trees. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net.